That was a different song than you, wasn't it? That was a different song than you rehearsed at 8.30 this morning, wasn't it? But I was sitting there thinking, and as, as I was singing along in my head, there is a name I love to hear. And you, you, just, you, just, you just seized that out of thin air and did it, didn't you? Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. But uh, I'm sure many of you know that great old hymn and, and then uh, blend it in with the chorus uh, in moments like these. So thank you, Melinda, for ministering to my, my spirit and heart this morning. Um, many of you probably know that uh, for six years, from 1990 through 1995, <coughs> Angie and I lived in San Jose, California, and pastored there. Um, what you probably don't know is that San Jose is the third largest city in California. There's Los Angeles, there's San Diego, and then there's San Jose. San Jose is bigger than San Francisco. San Jose is bigger than Oakland or bigger than Sacramento or some of the other cities you've heard about quite a bit. San Jose was a large city. It's a fairly safe city as large cities go, but like a number of large cities, it has gang activity. And the church that we pastored was located in a part of town, a part of town rather, to where our building got tagged by gangs a time or two. And on more than one occasion, I would grab a uh, can of paint and go out there the next morning and, and, and put paint on the, over the graffiti on the wood siding on our building because law enforcement told us that one of the best things you could do to kind of discourage that kind of stuff was to paint over it as quickly as you discovered it. In fact, while we lived in San Jose, the city enacted an ordinance um, to wear spray paint was kept behind lock and key at hardware stores or, or home improvement stores. You had, to, you had to go in and show ID to buy a can of spray paint like you would if you were trying to buy alcohol. You know, it was, you had to be a certain age, you know. You, you, they, they, they restricted the sale of spray paint. But it was amazing how it still seemed to find its way into the hands of those that were going to use it to go around and, and deface property and that kind of thing. And I, I was thinking about that, and, and this, this thought came to me that I just want to kind of float out to you and kind of make the launching point for what I want to share with you this morning. I sometimes wonder how many times those of us that call ourselves Christians, how many times we've done something similar to that when it comes to the reputation of Jesus, how many times we've defaced him because of our actions, because of our attitudes? How many times because of our poor choices or because of our bad behavior, how many times have we kind of tarnished people's opinion of him? Where it's become obscured or, or clouded? My guess is we've all done it. I know I, know I have. I mean, I can, I can look back, and I'm sure you can too, I can look back at, with regret at something I did that, that, that marred his reputation, that sullied somebody's opinion of him. I mean, the word Christian, it means little Christ or, or, or miniature Christ. And so that very word means that people ought to be able to see Jesus in and through the lives of those of us that say we're his followers. But I think for a lot of people that really isn't their experience at all. In their interactions with Christians, quote unquote, they've found us to be every bit as greedy, every bit as self-centered, every bit as materialistic and bullheaded and obstinate and other things like that as the average person on the street as a result. When they think of Christianity, they, they, they don't think of it as, as what it is. They, they, they see Christianity as many times nothing more than something that ruins your leisure weekend. You know, Christianity is a, is a bunch of rules that are, that are designed to kind of keep us from enjoying the pleasures of life. And folks, we know that Christianity is so much more than that. It's so much more. But if other people are going to see what it is and realize it is so much more, 
then it needs to make a difference in how we live. It needs to make a difference in how we conduct ourselves. Christianity, when you boil it down, Christianity can be summarized in two words. It is following Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. You follow Jesus. If you were here three weeks ago, first Sunday of this month, began a series that I'm calling Join the Journey. And I began by talking about a a vision for what Lakeside, I believe, someday can be. I'm convinced God is leading us in this direction, a a vision that flows out of of the longing Jesus has that His church be this enterprise that that, that builds people, that, that helps people to appropriate the resurrection power that He's placed within our lives. Romans chapter 8, verse 11, Paul says that the power that raised Jesus from the dead is living in us. It's in us. It's functioning in there, and and it's waiting to come out. And and the role, I believe, part of the role of the church is to help get what's in there out. If we've opened ourselves up to Jesus, if, if we've come into relationship with Him because of His shed blood and sacrificial death, Paul says, then that power that brought Him out of the grave on that first Easter morning, he goes, that's operative in you. And so the vision that I shared with you on that, that the three weeks ago, it really kind of flows out of the what if question when you play that out. What if, what if a group of people were to really lock on to that and really appropriate that power that the Bible tells us God has placed within us? What if that were to happen? I think the words I shared with you also are, 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 are consistent with, uh, with, with the marching orders that Jesus gave to us when he gave us the Great Commission. He told us that we should go into all the world and make disciples of people. Basically, he said, I want you to raise up people that are fully devoted, all in followers of me. In fact, that, that's our purpose statement in, the, in a nutshell. If somebody ever asks you what it is that the Lakeside Community Church is about, what it is that we are called to do, you can summarize it in a very succinct statement. The purpose of Lakeside Community Church is to raise up fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's why we exist. And so this morning, what I want to do is to begin to flesh that out. And I want to begin by talking about what it means for you and me to follow Jesus. What does that mean? It sounds easy. It sounds simple. It's very involved. And so let's talk about it this morning. I'm convinced that when you boil it down, the essence of what it means to be a Christian, like I said earlier, is that we're a follower of Jesus. And there's a lot of things in this book that makes me conclude that. For instance, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, we, when we, if we read in there, it's a very outset of Jesus' ministry. He's beginning. And, and he's gathering a team who will take this journey with him. And he approaches a couple of brothers who are fishermen by trade. And, and uh, sounds a call upon their lives. Beginning at verse 18 of Matthew chapter 4, it says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Duh. And Jesus said, Come, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Luke chapter 5. Same basic call is given to a guy named Levi, or otherwise known as Matthew, a tax collector by trade, 
But listen to what Jesus says to him or the call that Jesus sounds upon him, verses 27 and 28. It says, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Luke chapter 9, a few, ver- few chapters over, Jesus is with his disciples in a retreat setting. It's a time of assessment, it's a time of evaluation, and he asks them some questions. He asks them, who do other people think that I am? And he listened to their answer. Then he asks them, who do you say I am? And it's Simon Peter that has the courage to articulate, beautifully articulate, who Jesus was. He says, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, spot on. But he immediately issues a warning. He he sounds a note of challenge immediately after this wonderful confession of Christ on Peter's part. Verse 23, then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. One more, John chapter 21. John chapter 21 is an incredible scene where Peter goes through this, or Jesus rather, goes through this moving reinstatement process with Peter. Many of you know the story that Peter, in the face of the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, Peter failed Jesus miserably, denied having any association with him whatsoever. And so here in John 21, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus and Peter have a conversation And in this conversation, Jesus hints of the suffering that someday Peter will incur. And evidently, the apostle John was standing nearby, and Peter, in the course of the the conversation, says, Hey, what about him? You're you're talking about my fate, but but, but what about his fate? And listen to what Jesus says in, in verse 22. Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. I mean, when I look at these passages and look at the call that Jesus made on the lives of these guys, I'm convinced the very essence of what it means for you and me to be a Christian is that we are a follower of Jesus. And the language that it uses is rich with meaning. That word translated follow, it's a word that conveys the idea of of you identifying yourself with somebody else so closely to where who they are is systematically imparted and transferred into your life. The the, the word follow implies this growing, deepening relationship that steadily reforms the follower's life because of the influence, because of the impact of the leader. And so when Jesus issued a call for each of these men to follow him, he wasn't just asking them to adhere to a set of instructions. He he wasn't saying, hey guys, I want you to adopt some basic behavioral guidelines here. Uh Uh-uh. Jesus was asking them to embrace the totality of, of who he was about, to make an unswerving choice, to to, to immerse themselves in the way of life that he advocated. He, He was asking them to allow him to shape and craft and sculpt their life in some enduring ways. He was asking them, hey, I want you to undergo some significant change here. I want you to enter into a relationship with me in the belief that you're going to be a different and a better person as a result of that relationship. That's what it means in the Bible sense to follow. Folks, following is not some casual endeavor. Following is not some nonchalant undertaking. To follow in the Bible sense of the word is to make something your consuming passion. 
It's to make it your highest priority. It's to make it the preeminent reality in your life. Following in the Bible sense of the word is a call to emulate Jesus so completely that who he is defines who we are. That what he values informs what we value. That how he lives shapes how we live. Following is about committing yourself to a growing relationship that provides the resources for a radical transformation that will turn you into everything that God ever longed and desired that you be. And folks, when you think about following in those terms, My guess is there's a lot of us that don't really follow Jesus near as much as we say or as we think we do. In fact, I've often wondered how people's expectations of us would be different, how our own expectations of ourselves would be different. If we just did away with the word Christian, just, just, just threw that word out, and we have simply identified ourselves as followers of Jesus. Because I think for far too many people, we've reduced following Jesus to something we can do out of convenience. And like I said, when you look at following in the Bible, it's a much more exacting, it's a much more rigorous thing. I'm reminded of an occasion in the book of Acts. Many of you know the story. Early in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3 and 4. The story where Peter and John are, are going to the temple and they're, they're pulled before the governing council of the temple because they healed this beggar. That this beggar that had been a permanent fixture at the temple gates. They healed him. And, and, they, and they did it in the name of Jesus. And they advertised that. And the ruling council of the temple was the people that had just had Jesus killed a few weeks earlier. And they weren't too happy about that. And so Peter and John are apprehended. And they're brought in, and they're harassed, and they're threatened. And the way they conduct themselves is amazing. They don't back down. They don't shy away. In fact, I want you to listen to what it says about them in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. It says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they being the Sanhedrin, the temple leaders, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Something about the way Peter and John were following. Something about the way they lived their lives defined them as having been with Jesus. And these other people could see it. Something about the way they carried themselves. Something about the way they conducted themselves. It enabled people to pick up on, oh, they've been with Jesus. That's how it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to work. Not always the way it is. Because I think there's a lot of us, even though we call ourselves Christians, there's a lot of us who go through life or, or, or live with this, this idea or this notion as if Jesus exists to follow us. We're looking for him to satisfy our demands. We're looking for him to fulfill our wishes. We're looking for him to make our lives easier. And we've got it all backwards. God leads, we follow. That's how it's supposed to work. We're made by God to follow. We're created by Him to follow. But I realize many times it's awfully tough to be a follower when we're part of a culture that equates followership with weakness. You know, people think of being a follower... Oh, if you're a follower, you're, 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 you're dependent on somebody else. You're, you, you, you lack initiative. We, we're, we're into autonomy. We are into self-governance. 
I mean, we send our kids off to conferences and to clubs and to, to colleges so that they can hopefully come back as leaders. You know, when churches go through pastoral transitions, I'm sure one of the first questions they ask is they're evaluating candidates is, is, can this man or can this woman, can they lead this church into growth and to expand the ministry? A much greater concern is how gifted and skilled they are as a leader as opposed to how passionate and dis disciplined they are as a follower. But folks, in this endeavor, you can't lead unless you follow first. Amen. Good leadership flows out of good followership. That's where it starts. And so along comes Jesus. This guy who lived a couple of thousand years ago. This guy whose face we can't see, whose voice we can't hear, whose hand we can't hold. And he places the same call upon us that he placed upon those disciples a couple thousand years ago. Follow me. Make me your passionate pursuit. Make me the central reality around which everything else in your life revolves. Jesus asks us to establish him as our preeminent priority. To, to, to take our cues from him as, as to what we're to about. To allow him to guide our lives to guide our thinking as to what we someday hope to be. But I am convinced, I am convinced that the outcomes in our life ultimately rest on whether we choose to be the leader of our destiny or whether we opt to be a follower and let somebody else that is wiser and stronger and better fit to lead assume control of our lives. We're meant to follow Jesus. Following Jesus is meant to drive and define all we do and all we are. And folks, following Jesus, it's not about fulfilling an obligation. It's about maintaining affiliation with the person. F following Jesus is not about adhering to some system. It's about staying close to a Savior. It's not about rules. It's about nurturing and furthering a meaningful relationship. And, and if your Christian life has become kind of dull and kind of boring, if it's become more of a burden and less of a blessing, then maybe it's because you've turned your faith into this religious thing, this, this set of traditions to uphold, this, this series of paces to put yourself through. Followership is not meant to be a religious thing. Followership is meant to be a directional thing. And just as the sun is at the very center of the solar system and everything else tracks around it, so Jesus is meant to be the central reality around which everything in our life tracks. He's to bring light and life and purpose and meaning and direction to all that we do. But for a lot of us, Jesus really isn't the center. He's in there somewhere. But we've kind of relegated him to one of those tracks that circles around whatever it is that we've put at the center. And rather than seeking to ever track closer to him we, we, so we can more adequately reflect him, we're, we're content to just merely relate to him. I mean, we, 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 we're, we're glad to know he saved us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we welcome the solace and the comfort that, that He provides for us in tough times. And, and, and we're glad to know that He's available and accessible so we don't feel totally isolated and alone in this cruel and hostile world. But when it comes to following Him unconditionally, when it comes to making Him the overriding, passionate pursuit of our lives, we're not naturally bent that way, are we?
I am convinced that passionate, relentless following of Jesus is what makes a difference in the world. And and I think back again to the early church, to those first followers. They didn't have much going for them. They, They were very much a minority presence in a hostile environment. They had little to offer in terms of power, influence. They they were not connected to the power brokers of the day. They were not associated with the movers and shakers of that time. But they followed Jesus. They, they, They followed him relentlessly. They followed him passionately. They followed him wholeheartedly. And in the hearts and minds of a watching world, they made their mark. Because their lifestyle was dramatically and productively and winsomely different from those around them. It was so different that it kind of piqued people's curiosity. And over the course of time, folks begin to place stock in this Jesus. Value in this one who enabled them to live these lives of generosity and grace. This this one who empowered them to stand firm in the face of poverty and persecution. And I'm convinced that in this day, we've got a world that resembles in many ways that first century world. And in the clamor and the confusion of our world, I believe Jesus walks up to us with the same call that he extended to those disciples a couple thousand years ago. He says, will you follow me? And the key issue, the key issue is whether we're going to be like those disciples that dropped their nets and left their livelihood and took off after him. Or whether we're going to be like those would-be disciples who said, you know, I've got some other matters I need to tend to. Or maybe we'll be like the rich young ruler who sat there and said, you know, the price of what you're asking, it's, it's just too steep for my liking. I think it comes down to this. As it relates to following Jesus, we can either make him the focus of our life or we can make excuses. Jesus came into this world to offer us an abundant life. But the life that he came to offer, I'm convinced, is a byproduct of a commitment on our part to follow him. A commitment to absolute, unconditional, unmitigated, unreserved followership of Jesus. And so this morning, I just want to ask you a question. Is Jesus the singular, passionate pursuit of your life? If he were to look over your shoulder, if he were to examine your life, would he conclude that the principal commitment, the priority, the number one main commitment of your life is to follow him with resolve and abandon? And the reason I ask that question is because, like I said earlier, we aren't aren't naturally bent on that. But folks, this deal called Christianity, it it isn't about us trying to make room for him somewhere in our overcrowded lives. It's about letting him have control of everything. It's about making him the preeminent reality in our life. It's about letting him lead and being committed to unmitigated followership. And my sense is that there's a lot of us who probably aren't there right now. 
Maybe we were at one time. But life happens and stuff changes and, and, and we're not there right now. Now probably chances are on the outside we're making all the right moves. We're saying all the right things. We're doing all the right stuff. But on the inside when we sit there and are painfully honest with ourselves we know that we're calling the shots. And we're the ones that is exercising control. I think sometimes we relate to Jesus as if he's some commodity that we're going to ship somewhere. And we get this box and we put Jesus in that box and we sit there and say, stay there, don't move. And folks, in this day, that's not going to get the job done. That's not going to get it done at all. That kind of life, that kind of self-managed life. That's going to leave us empty. It's going to leave us bankrupt. And the Bible tells us that the fullest life we can know, the fullest life available to us, is the life that Jesus wants to give us. It's an abundant life. And it says it's only a commitment away. But the commitment that needs to be made to access and tap into that life is a commitment to follow without hesitation, without reservation, without limitation, to just follow. That's when we unlock the door to the fullness. That's when we take away the hinge to the abundance that we are so desperately seeking. The calling that God has placed upon us as a church is a call to raise up fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Not to raise up casual adherents. Not to raise up fickle supporters. To raise up fully devoted followers. And folks, the fact of the matter is, we don't raise up what we want, we raise up what we are. And if that's what we're called to do, then we need to make sure that we are that. So let me ask you, are you one? Right here, right now, are you there yet? If not, you can be. This requires a step. It's a tough step because it's a step of surrender. It's a step of yielding. But it's an incredibly rewarding step as well. Because when we make the step of surrender and yield ourselves fully to God and say, I'm going to follow you with everything I have. That's when the abundance of life kicks in. And when the abundance of life kicks in and we make that kind of declaration, that's when God can use a group of people to change the world I want to be a world changer and I want to pastor a group of people that want to be world changers it happens when we follow and if we're going to follow we must surrender so I want you to stand and I want us to sing together this great old hymn that many of you know. I surrender all. And if God is nudging or prompting you, and you'd like to just slip out and come and talk to Him and raise a white flag, I invite you to do it as we sing. Let's lift our voices together. The first verse. All to Jesus. Verse. Father, I'm so grateful 
for the work of your spirit in this place and for the work that you're doing even now, drawing people to yourself. And not just to a casual adherence to you, but to a sold out, spot on, all in, radical commitment to you. Thank you, Jesus. I just pray that in these moments that as there's decisions being made and yieldedness being exacted, that that, that you by your Spirit would step into that place and that there would be a confirmation that they would know. And Father, as we sing this fourth and final verse, when we talk about the fact that we sense and feel you, I pray that that be the testimony of every person in this room, that we feel you so near and so close to where we will live out the kind of unreserved followership that you call us to. Let's sing that fourth verse together, and we'll be through. To invite any of you that would feel so inclined to just slip out and come and pray with these that have come. Support them, love them, encourage them. Don't badger them. Father, again, we're so grateful for the work that you do and the work that you've done and the calling that you have upon us. May we follow with resolve, with abandon. And may you be glorified as a result. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for being here. God's richest, greatest blessings upon you.